Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Thamburri. The human animal has survived millennia for its ability to adapt to its environment. Yet with the developments of human societies, it became important to retain identity. This is particularly true for immigrants, who must balance old tradition with the new. How does an old-school pizzeria in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, accommodate its changing clientele? Lucia Grillo goes to the source. Summertime is upon us, and with it, all the accoutrements, picnics, barbecues. The Italian-American grill always has sausage and peppers next to the hot dogs. But the joy of overabundance often affects health, and much more. One young woman has taken this issue to task. Marina Benedetto of Yad Dog talks to us about her vegetable-based, gluten-free hot dogs. Celebrating its 43rd year, the New York Conference of Italian-American State Legislators honored five distinguished members of the community this month and partied afterward at its annual festa. Italics go to the state capitol and is joined by none other than our governor, Andrew Cuomo. Um, you know, I think the Italian-American experience really is different in many ways. In business for over 20 years, Sal's Pizza has become a mainstay of Italian-American Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Mimo, Sal's proprietor, felt he had to get with the times, trading his espresso machine for draft beer. Is it too much? We'll find out. Let's go to Italics correspondent Lucia Grillo at Sal's Pizza. I bought this place in 1982. Uh, I'm here 30, 33, 34 years now. I grew up in Queens, uh, Bayside, Whitestone area. When I told my mom I'm going to Brooklyn, she told me, what are you, nuts? What do you want to go to Brooklyn for? Because in the 80s, you know, it was not one of those uh, places you want to live, you know? What did make you move here? Well, my, uh, the guy that lived next door to me in, in Queens, in uh, Wildstone, he originally came from this area, and I was in college. And I used to work in a pizza place in Bayside. When he told me you want to buy a pizza place in Brooklyn, I said, Brooklyn? I said, I've never been to Brooklyn, you know? So I came, and I liked the area, you know, and I see it was a nice area, so I'm, I made the move. And, you know, I seen a lot of changing. This always was a nice area, but the surrounding, you know, they were a little bit rough. But now... It's paradise here in Williamsburg. Everybody wants to live in Williamsburg. I've seen kids growing up, you know, getting married and have their own kids, you know? So what was the neighborhood like when you first moved here 32 years ago? Nothing strictly Italian. I'm from Bari, Puglia, but a lot of people came from Campania, Napoli, Salerno. On a Sunday, everybody had pizza. You know, they used to eat at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but at nighttime, everybody, you know, pizza was pizza night. Friday night was pizza night, you know? And then Saturday, people came here for lunch, you know, but, you know, that whole thing changed, you know. What's your clientele like now? Who comes in? It's all young kids, you know, no more families, you know. All the families, it seems like they move out or they can't afford here. What are the biggest changes you've noticed in all these years or in the, even in the past, let's say, 10 years? I think my biggest change was that when the subway used to shut down here at 9 o'clock on Lorma Street. Now it's like constantly, I can't stop moving my head back and forth, seeing people going back and forth. It was very calm, you know, 9 o'clock the subway shut down people used to come in now it's like constantly you know we're pretty busy all the time because it's a lot of people live in uh, Williamsburg there's all this grown up you know they all want to drink beer and wine years ago it was all like you know little kids you know summertime came and there used to be a line for ISIS you know so I had to make a few changes to better my business otherwise I would have been left behind we're taking a lot of orders online which we never used to do that we never you know even delivered two blocks away now we deliver all over because no, all these kids from their smartphone they just make orders you know that's one another big change too so do you have people that are complaining that come in here for espresso and don't find their espresso no, but they understand. Well, they understand. You know, there's a lot of coffee shops, so I can compete, you know, by me making espresso. What do you think about the switch? Like he recently put in the beer tap. I think that was a brilliant idea because you want to service your customers, your neighborhood, and and that that's very high in demand around here. You know, people want to you know relax and have a beer, a glass of wine with their pizza, you know, and so you know it's a brilliant move. It's long overdue. Do you think sometimes we hold on to tradition too tightly? I don't think too tightly but I think tradition is a good thing we need that we need you know tradition you know and that this place offers tradition and I think that's a nice balance that they offer where would you draw the line and say absolutely not that is one thing I am not changing about this pizzeria I don't care who moves into the neighborhood 
Don't ever put pineapple on top of the pizza. That's one thing I would never do. <laughs> you know, we got a lot of requests of different types of pizza, and I said, no, this is it, you know? My father would turn in his grave if I put pineapple on top of the pizza, you know? You know, my dad used to work with me. He worked with me from, he died in 92, so he was with me for 10 years, you know? How do the conversations you have with your clients from, say, 82 to now, how does the conversation change? Before we used to talk about maybe sports or, you know, what are you going on vacation? Now you talk about uh, iPhone, emails, how do you email something, this graphic designer, that's all we talk about, you know? <laughs> Smartphones. What do you think hipsters think of Italian Americans? Oh, they love it. I think they love it because they're getting good food. I mean, you know, especially this area has got great restaurants. Every pizza place makes it a good pizza, and the hipsters love it. I think they love it. That's why everybody I think moves, you know, moves here. Do you think that that pizza, a slice, is still the number one food of New York? I think so. It's quick. I think it's very healthy, you know, especially the way we make it. We use everything, you know, natural, cheese, sauce, and dough. I think it's better a hot dog or, a, or what you might call a hamburger, you know, that greasy food, you know. What do you see as the future for Williamsburg? I see Williamsburg as being like the Soho in about 10 years. This place is going to be like Soho. People won't be able to afford it. You're only going to have like people with money around here. Even, you know, the young hipster, there won't be no hipster. They're going to be like this finance guys or like graphic design. People that make big money because I see, you know, people got a lot of money that live here because the rents, the rents are very high. Do you still, do you live in the neighborhood or do you just have the pizzeria? I can't afford to live here. I mean, I was born and raised in Italy. I came here when I was 12 years old, and I'm very proud of my heritage, you know? I'm an American now, but I mean, in my heart, Italy's always in my heart. So how do you hold on to your buddies in this? Well, I feel that Sunday, Sunday at 2 o'clock, I want my kids, my wife, everybody together. We gotta have dinner together. I believe in that. And sometimes when I'm home, usually, you know, I work, but if I was home, I'd like to have dinner with my family. That's where you discuss family, problems, whatever. And people sense that. My kids, like I got two girls, they really sense that. They like that Sunday dinner or even when I'm home. Sometimes, you know, I got to work, you know, and I cannot be home. Because, you know, the pizza place, you know, it's a long hours. How old are your girls? 26 and 23. So they're really, they're really still into the culture and being with the family? Especially my oldest daughter. We go to Italy every year. She loves it. She's very proud to be Italian-American. She, she's American-Italian. I'm Italian-American because I was born there. She was born here. What about the traditions here, right? There's like the Giglio feast. There are all these feast days. No, it's still here. A lot of these hipsters love that. They love that because they never seen something like that. Like on Sunday, Giglio, I see a lot of my customers, they, you know, they ask me. And they love it. I think they enjoy it. I think that, that Giglio will never die. Because it's, it's a great feast, you know, and they do a great job. Whoever's running it, they do a great job. Willie B is the place to be. Summer, barbecues. After a long winter, the sun finally shines upon us, and we spend as much time as we can outdoors with friends and family. Two Italian-Americans, the backyard barbecue has become as symbolic as the requisite pasta on the table at Thanksgiving. Celebrating abundance is meaningful to immigrants and perhaps implanted in the genetic memory of their descendants. Yet the Italian-American diet is not as healthy as that of our Italian counterpart. And health issues can arise, not to mention other factors in such gross consumption. Marina Benedetto, founder of Yad Dog, a vegetable-based gluten-free hot dog, shows us how it's done the healthy way. Going. Oh, good to see you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marina, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, this is a very contemporary but very Italian name, Marina Benedetto. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I'm an Italian American from New Jersey. I've uh -huh. um, been living in New York for like 11 years now, but I grew up in New Jersey. Always come into the city as a kid and just. Um, have a big Italian family. We've never actually been to Italy together or anything, but mm -hmm. um, uh, New Jersey Italian culture, which Did is you its own thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Tell us a little about what's it like. A very, very heavily meat-centered, very much, you know, um, dairy and meat. 
uh, mm -hmm. in the culture, which I think has a lot to do with me stepping outside of that. Um, also, just a very patriarchal, very male-centered culture where uh -huh. the woman kind of, you know, is a little bit more. So it's just very different than how I am, but mm -hmm. I still enjoy some of the culture. What parts do you enjoy? Um, the loudness, the way people talk on top of each other and just talk a lot and just the warmth. You don't feel very, you know, it's not a cold energy, it's a warm energy uh -huh. usually. Mm -hmm. So. That's a nice way to grow up. So yeah. then what prompted you to kind of come away from that patriarchal and the the animal, the dairy and meat aspect? Um, I don't I was younger. I was well, I started questioning um vegetarianism when I was like seven or six uh -huh. because we went to a farm on a class trip and that's when it all occurred to me that the same animals that I loved were actually the same thing on my plate and so that's where like the connection was made but I wasn't actually able to cook for myself until around 12. Mm -hmm. I've always was interested in it but everyone was like no nah, that's you know stupid don't do that you gotta eat meat you're gonna so then by the time I was 12 I was able to actually cook for myself and that's when I made the full commitment mm -hmm. um, to vegetarianism and then later on uh, vegan at like 18 when I left the house which was easier so just the independence that you know it gave me was good too because it also taught me to cook for myself and to think outside of the box. Um, it, you have to be really creative at that time mm -hmm. living in New Jersey as a 12 year old <laughs> to not eat meat. <laughs> so I think it just really helped me flourish uh -huh. what are um, some of the as things? a food person in the world, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are some of the things that you had to do? Well, at the time, I mostly at the lunchroom in school, I would have to get like the bagel and the cookie, mm -hmm. which is really bad for you, but I would just eat that or every day. the french day. fries. Yeah, exactly, because <laughs> I didn't know what, how to really, and then I just slowly taught myself how to cook, probably like, you know, as I got older, just like tofu and vegetables was mm -hmm. how I started cooking vegan, and then mm -hmm. eventually it just became a lot more once I was able to like, you know, when I moved out of the house and was able to just like cook for myself, get into all different things, kale and nutritional yeast and cool. cashews and nuts and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, just figuring out how to work with them more. And you started your own business. Yes. How did that come about? What prompted you? What inspired you? Well, I always kind of wanted to do something with food. I mean, I was started off my career in working as a person in the world as a food person. I started off as a disher, dishwasher. Um, food runner, busser, so I was just always in that industry. I did line cook stuff and then um, eventually I got a job after college as like a counselor at a homeless youth drop-in. But before I was a counselor, I was the chef there for like two and a half years. Um, so it was like counseling and cooking, but um, just basically had to cook a lot of like healthy options for people who had compromised immune systems and who were just used to eating like street food and McDonald's. So that's kind of where I got the idea for like um, taking something that's familiar and comfortable but veganizing it making it like totally plant-based nutritious but also like comforting and familiar and not alienating and so like I had the idea and then uh, eventually I got laid off like in 2012 and that's when I took the time to just develop the business I took like a month-long intensive free course that they have actually um called like Fast Track. It's really oh. cool if anybody wants to be Where is that? Where do you take that course? Um, it's part of like New York City Business Solutions. Oh. It's like a SUNY program uh -huh. and so basically it's free and they give you like a textbook, how to write your business plan. Oh my god. Um, they like make you present your idea to the class and go with your logo to the class and it just was great for me and I did that month-long intensive while in unemployment. Uh -huh. uh, it gave me the time to really do it and that kind of got me serious about it. Uh -huh. um, it went from an idea to an actuality because also they made us go to the business library and do different research and just oh. stuff that I probably wouldn't have done without taking that class. So uh -huh. it was a really good um, resource in New York That's for people really good. and it's free. So that just really kind of, you just that rocketed the idea right into to a reality. I thought about food business and I actually thought about doing a vegan Italian thing because uh -huh. I love to like recreate dishes that are Italian but without dairy because mm -hmm. I think it's like really possible but it's never done. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Like. Yeah. So it's just something that I really wanted to do, but then I thought to myself, what does New York really need? And I just thought about it, and I was like, hot dogs. Hot dogs are on every corner, and at mm -hmm. first I was gonna do my own hot dog but use gluten, mm -hmm. and I started like that, making them like that. And then I was like, you know what? Like, this is like, why do this? This has already been done. Mm -hmm. And so I just like adjusted the recipe eventually until I was able to make it um, completely gluten-free. Beets, sweet potatoes, potatoes, carrots, sunflower seeds, and then, you know, just like a blend of 
gluten-free flour, herbs and then and spices. if they're soy-free as well. Yes, yeah, so for people who have whatever reactions to or aversions to yeah, soy, nut-free, soy-free, and gluten-free. So it's so. the perfect food, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it covers all the, you know, the areas. And then with all hopefully. the toppings you put on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that helps make it. Because also I'm a Gemini and I love options, uh -huh. and like I couldn't decide on a few. I had to have nine. <laughs> so yeah, that's why there's so many. So toppings. what's your favorite version when you eat one? Um, definitely the pineapple pickle uh -huh. with coconut bacon yeah. and the kale Caesar Whoa. on top and then the cashew mayo. Yeah. yeah. Yummy. <laughs> and do you ever veer? A lot of the time I just get everything, most of the time. But <laughs> Which is like this pile, yeah. like this high. Yeah, <laughs> depending on if we're running low on anything, I'll do that, right? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the process, because you started really, really handmade, and now you've had a successful Kickstarter campaign, which allowed you to buy a machine to help you. Yeah, it's been really crazy. Um, it's been like, I've been really blessed because since day one, um, actually, we're about to turn two in a few days. Oh, congratulations. But, <laughs> thank you. But since day one, people were, yeah, like, lining up and being really, like, can I have a yeah dog and asking for it by name? And mm -hmm. it, it just always felt like somehow it was right mm -hmm. or something. So if, I've been lucky. And so it's just gained popularity in New York and then eventually, like, um, just pop-ups we've been doing. Unfortunately, I wish we can do more. Mm -hmm. There's not enough, really, to be at because we're only popping up, like, twice a week. Wow. But it would be great if we can do something more. I'm looking for that now. Uh -huh. but, for like um, an actual storefront of your own, or just, or just more, like more? sharing something with someone? Because uh -huh. I've, I've researched um, storefronts in New York, and you really need a lot of money. It's it's kind of insane, and I don't know if I can handle that without some type of, uh, you know, investor or backer yeah, or some type yeah. of help. Yeah. Um, so right now, what we're doing is we're focusing on, you know, with the Kickstarter, we we got the. Yeah, we funded it in probably around the end of February, early March. Mm -hmm. We just spent a bunch of time trying to ship um, all the rewards to people, and now we've got our head around um, shipping frozen food nationwide. So we're going to actually start doing that at the end of the month Fantastic. for 4th of July. Woo. And we also, yeah, we got the right vacuum sealer we need. We got the machines we need. We've been testing. So eventually we, ha we still are hand rolling them because we haven't found the right co-packer to go with. We mm -hmm. want to go with someone who's vegan and stuff like that. And so it's actually hard to find. So we're searching for that now. Uh -huh. But um, in the meantime, we are building the business, you know, still. And um, when you say we, you do mostly everything oh, yeah. by yourself, when I say right? me, you When assistant. I say we, I just mean, yeah, dog, as a collective. <laughs> but yeah, me. But I do have some people who help work in the kitchen and stuff mm -hmm. and events. But most of it is me, yeah. You mentioned. Um, counseling and cooking which is so very much an Italian it I just know. reminded me did that come from like it's being so in the real. kitchen yeah in the, in and the someone house. once said to me I don't get it how are you going to combine social work and food I was like are you kidding me like it's like the main combination it's you an know? innate quality yeah but it really works yeah it, it's true something about feeding people and healing people mm -hmm. and, and you know talking to them mm -hmm. food is comfort and yeah. and also a way to get in to talk to people and engage and get to know where they're at and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been great for that aspect of it. And then thinking of that as well, you one of your goals is? Yeah, one of my goals is to work with youth, um, mm -hmm. you know, from New York who just need, you know, jobs and just want to get be given a chance instead of some type of, you know, really crappy start off minimum wage job, you know. Mm -hmm. So eventually we want to build it to that point. You know, we would love to do a cart or something, but it's kind of hard to do here because of the lottery, but that would be awesome and then just have people working that with us and, you know, just cooking and learning about all the the processes and the vegan stuff okay. and getting in touch with farmers and stuff would be awesome and just having a connection, you mm -hmm. know, with land too, eventually, hopefully, upstate. Uh -huh. But right now, um, our main thing is pop-ups and we're also trying to grow the brand nationwide and be in stores. Um, we're packaging them now in packs of four. Mm -hmm. You know, we just we just designed some new packaging, which I'm excited about, and hopefully that'll be out soon. And yeah, and you can get them right now only on Good Eggs and Haymakers, mm -hmm. but we're slowly building more stores up. Okay. Good Eggs and Haymakers are for, for our viewers. Good Street. Eggs is a delivery service that now delivers to Manhattan, uh -huh. which is awesome. They cool. deliver to Brooklyn and Manhattan, and they're like a fresh direct for like local and organic farmer type things and like artisanal things. And so our hot dogs are on there. Um, along with a lot of cool vegan friends we have that also saw on there. Um, and so you can get them delivered right to you. Whoa, uh, cool. Or you can go to this vegan grocery store in Williamsburg called Haymaker. We sell them there too, for cool. now. But we're, like by the end of next month, hopefully we'll be in like at least three or four more. We're working on that now. Okay. Because if I remember <laughs> correctly, at the beginning you were delivering on, bicycle. on your bicycle. <laughs> yeah, but that got too hard. I can imagine balance it like doing. It got really hard to like yeah. drop off packs to people, yeah. and so the store thing is. 
is cool. We're working on that now. Oh, that's so great. Simultaneously still doing the pop-up. You had mentioned, you know, backers and stuff like that, and you recently participated in something that was not only testament to the success of Yeah Dog and how rapidly it's growing, but also like exponentially rising interest in veganism. Yeah, we were on a show called Restaurant Startup. Basically, you know, you get a chance to give your pitch. Who is making the hot dogs for you now? I make them. You, you make them? Every single one. You make every hot dog? <laughs> I hand roll have them Have you all. ever tried to have someone else make them for you, like no. a commissary? That's the next step. How many hot dogs do you make in one day? That's what I want to know. 508 <laughs> hours. What? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Much. <laughs> And uh, if you win in that round, there's two, another team. Then you go on to get a chance to get your own, to run your own pop-up restaurant in LA, uh -huh. in a pop-up space, and you get like a few days to do it, like two days to get it all going. And you have the restaurant run. That's produced and hosted by Joe Bastianich. Yeah, Joe Bastianich and Tim Love. In anticipation of the episode, we did a, a pop-up for two days at Italy, and we sold out um, for the lunch the wow. first day. And so, yeah, it did really well there. That's a lot of people write us about it and want us to get back in there. Um, yeah, it was, it was good. I mean, I think they were very, the chefs there were like, wait, we don't have, like, you know, they're not used to doing something without cheese. Mm -hmm. So it was like, even the vegetarian chefs was like, oh, we can do a little, like, uh, pecorino, romano. And I was like, no, that's not vegan. <laughs> so I had to work with them a little bit on, like, just what was vegan, because vegetarian and vegan for them is very, yeah. you know, they don't yeah. get the, the dairy thing. <laughs> How's it going? It's going very well. Oh, good to see you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Being face to face with the, your customers, it seems here like you have a regular, let's say, clientele, but it seems more like friends. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It feels, I think, um, I don't know, something about it feels, feels better to me to be able to you know, experience that. I think that's the food truck life, the, the cart life, the pop-up life is very like that, whereas the restaurant, there's a very big difference between front of house and back of house. Mm -hmm. um, here, it's just all blurred together, and I like that, <laughs> yeah. And then is it also so. part, of, like, part of the vegan community? Is that, is that also an element of Oh, that? yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, Beyonce's everywhere on the internet now <laughs> with veganism, and it, it does seem to be everywhere now, um, mm -hmm. and it's kind of cool because I didn't know that somehow the time of Yeah Dog is at the time where it's getting, maybe that's why I had to do it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but no, I really love it. I think it's really cool. I mean, sometimes it's annoying when people paint the picture of it as mostly a diet, which mm -hmm. I mean, I think is a little bit like, I mean, I love that it's healthy and mm -hmm. stuff like that, but I also think it's really about the animals and the environment too. Mm -hmm. We can't forget that. It's Tell cruelty. a little bit about that. Tell about... Yeah. I mean, for me, the original reason why I got into veganism, vegetarianism, um, was because I just thought it was wrong to treat animals that way or to eat animals or to, you know, to have them in those conditions. And so I think a lot of the time the celebrity vegan is kind of more about <clears throat> the diet of mm -hmm. it and how they got skinny right. versus like <laughs> what, what actually political things it could lead to um, mm -hmm. in terms of like, you know, the environment, just like how, you know, cattle and the meat industry uses up so much water and how veganism obviously proves that you save the environment by doing it. Just mm -hmm. one person even being vegetarian helps, you know. Yeah. Um, one one vegan I forget saves the like statistics. The, a lot it's of a cows lot. Lives, yeah, it's like yeah. one vegan saves like a hundred cows right. lives a and year. And to or raise something. one yeah. cow is like in like <clears throat> incredible amounts of water resources. You know, people say, Oh, people ate meat in the beginning of time but I think obviously like people also didn't listen to iPods in the beginning of time. You know, evolution <laughs> technology has happened and we can come to a place where we, we can choose not to participate mm -hmm. in that. It's it's already, you know, they have vegan eggs now. You can pretty much get anything vegan. That's true, fish, yeah, everything. Yeah. Cupcakes. <laughs> yeah, so there's really no excuse anymore. <laughs> exactly. What what other goals for expansion do you have? Like, what do you dream of? <clears throat> what would be the ultimate for, yeah, dog? Well, definitely to have our own commercial space where we produce everything would be great. Um, trying to find that and then also being able to have some type of cart situation. If anyone knows any connections to that would be would be cool. Where can people contact you? Yeah dog vegan at gmail. Yeah dog vegan dot com. Oh. Um, we're better on Instagram and Twitter obviously uh -huh. with like updating everything. Uh -huh. But our website is a good place to check to you. Great. Right. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming in. Yeah and talking totally. To us. Thank you. For over twenty years the Conference of Italian American State Legislators has held a day of proclamation, recognized by the State Assembly, celebrating the achievements of Italian Americans. Since elected to office, Governor Andrew Cuomo has attended the conference and rubbed elbows with his paisani. 
The governor spoke about how Italian Americans, having been marginalized themselves, should be part of eradicating discrimination. Italics goes to Albany to celebrate along with the conference and its honorees and talks with the governor himself. This day, we are proclaiming a resolution memorializing today, Italian American Day in New York State. The 2015 Italian American of the Year Awards went to Paul Sorvino, John Reagan, Nino Corvato, and Lifetime Achievement recipient Matilda Rafa Cuomo. The governor hosted a luncheon at the executive mansion and spoke to how Italian Americans should be part of eradicating discrimination. The Italian American story in some ways is the universal story of the immigrants that came to New York. Uh, economically, they were conservative people. Why? Because they were poor. And when you're poor, you value every dollar that you spend. But they were progressive politically. They wouldn't have said that, but they were progressive politically. Meaning what? Meaning you don't judge other people. And you accept people and you accept the differences of other people. And it doesn't matter their religion and the color of their skin or their orientation, you accept people. And the Italians understood this. And they understand it to this day because the Italians have been victims of discrimination and they did feel isolated and they did feel different. So they can relate to that feeling of discrimination. They really can. Uh, the modern day incarnation of that is where, when we passed marriage equality in this administration because it said we're not going to discriminate, we're not going to judge, you live your life, God bless, and we respect your choices. And that was very important to the Italian Americans. So in some ways their story was the universal story. The festa was abundant with music, pizza, calamari, and people having a good time, plus an italics exclusive. You made a very beautiful speech today. It was timely and really spoke to something that usually is not thought of um, of Italian Americans about discrimination and how Italian Americans should understand um, other marginalized peoples. Can you speak more to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the Italian American experience really is different in many ways. There are certain components that are universal to the immigrant experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the belief in education is the way forward, the belief in family, the belief in extended family and community as your support group. But the Italian American people also were subject to discrimination. And we tend to forget that now. You know, I talk to my, uh, my young daughters about this. I remember my grandparents deeply affected uh, at the stereotypes of the early Italian Americans, mm -hmm. uh, the connection with the organized crime, the sense that they were the poor and the uneducated from Italy. Uh, and they were uh, very hurt by those stereotypes and those impressions. And it gave them a sensitivity always uh, not to judge others, that New York in this country is about acceptance. And if a person is black or white or Jewish or Christian or Muslim, you don't judge people like that. And they learned that lesson because they were judged. And they had that pain and they had those scars. Uh, and I think that's why they've always shown a special sensitivity. I think that's where my father got it from and I think that's where uh, I learned it from. And that's what I want to pass on. We're not going to allow discrimination against anyone because we felt its sting ourselves. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Italics. Catch up on our previous editions of Italics at cuny.tv slash show slash Italics and additional digital programming on our Italics YouTube channel, Italics TV. Tune in to our next episode airing July 29th. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.